So I didn't finish my title actually, but so it was kind of like neuromuscular causes. Um, so like motor inflate and then just other kind of restrictive processes as well. Um, so kind of one of the top ones that we think of is myasthenia gravis. So um, it's characterized clinically by muscle weakness, fatigue, uh, common ocular complaints for diplopia and ptosis. So this condition, you know, classically involves a skeletal and not uh, visceral musculature. So pupil and ciliary muscles should be unaffected. Um, ocular involvement is common, um, and it can be the initial complaint, so it's something we kind of have to pay attention to and always have on our radar. Um, there's antibodies to the acetylcholine receptors in the motor end plate uh, that reduce the number of receptors available for transmission of uh, motor signal. Um, and then I got cut off, but uh, the clinical, uh, the, the ophthalmic kind of characteristics, so variability of muscle function within minutes, hours, days, or weeks. and so. I, I was seeing a patient in a neuro clinic last year, and uh, I presented to Dr. Katz, and then he went in and got totally different measurements and looked at me like I was an idiot. And then he goes, oh, well, what's the thing that makes residents look like idiots? He said myasthenia. That's what it was. So um, it, it can like vary like, from when you go in the room and somebody else goes in the room, which makes it really difficult when you're trying to present the patient. Um, there's remissions and exacerbation, so it's not kind of a, a tonic process. It can vary in terms of body temperature, infection, or other kind of insults. You can have onset at any age. Um, there's ptosis, it can be unilateral or bilateral, and it can shift from side to side. Um, the extraocular movement involvement follows no set pattern, so it can be a gaze palsy, nystagmus, intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. Um, and then in terms of OCAPs, there's a uh, it's not common, but kind of more common than you'd expect association with uh, dysthyroidism. And so it goes the same way. Patients with dysthyroidism can also have myasthenia. Um, so kind of the, the signs that we see, typically lid fatigue with sustained upgaze, Kogan lid twitch. So if you have people look down for 10 to 15 seconds and then look up to primary position, you can have an overshoot of the eyelid. Um, enhanced ptosis, so this is one you look at in plastics clinic with Dr. Karam all the time. So um, if the ptosis is asymmetric, they might kind of activate their frontalis uh, muscles to kind of help lift the lid. Um, so that can produce an apparent lid retraction on one side. If you elevate the lower eyelid, um, that causes the retracted eyelid to fall. And so that's, you know, especially if you're doing like a unilateral external levator resection, that's one thing you kind of check before you actually start cutting. Um, and then myasthenia ptosis is often associated with orbicularis weakness too, so checking your orbicularis strength can be good. Um, thyroid eye disease is the next one. Uh, it's a restrictive myopathy, so most commonly kind of middle or older aged patients, you get a lymphocytic and plasmacytic chronic infiltrate of the extraocular muscles. Um, so that gives you edema and then activation of fibroblasts, so there's production of acid mucopolysaccharide and fibrosis. And so, like you'd expect, it can give you a variety of defects. So you can have what appears to be an elevator palsy. So it's a superduction deficit due to fibrotic shortening of an inferior rectus. You can have abduction weakness due to involvement of the medial rectus mimicking a cranial nerve 6 palsy. Um, and you can have really anything else, too. It's thyroid disease, and so it's always on your differential. Um, the kind of classic way to memorize the frequency of the muscles involved is that I'm slow. So uh, inferior is uh, more common than medial, is more common than superior, is more common than lateral. Yeah. So uh, some of the additional findings, you can get proptosis, lid retraction, lid lag on down gaze, which is von Grafe's sign, it's the eponym, um, kind of conjunctival injection or chemosis, uh, always make sure you're looking at the cornea, just they can get pretty bad corneal erosions or ulceration even. Um, and then in the books it says like 5% develop optic neuropathy due to compression of the orbital apex due to enlarged extraocular muscles. Um, so one, another thing that comes up on OCAPS is kind of the order to proceed with, uh, with surgical repair. And so kind of the first thing is decompression and then strabismus and then eyelid surgery last. Um, the, the eyelid surgery can also change the position of some of the extracular muscles um, that have been worked on during strabismus and that sort of thing and worsen any strabismus or 
anything like that. So that's why you did the lids last. Um, for some reason, specs didn't get capitalized here, but um, in terms of kind of grading classification, um, one of the or one of the mnemonics they've come up with is no specs, and um, just as a way to, to grade the severity of thyroid eye disease. And so it starts off, you know, there's no signs or symptoms. Then the next one is only signs of lid retraction, lid lag, or a gaze stare. Then you can have soft tissue uh, signs and symptoms, which this actually spells out relief. So resistance to retropulsion, edema of the conjunctiva caruncle, lacrimal gland enlargement, injection of the rectus muscle insertions, edema of the eyelids, or fullness of the eyelids. Next is proptosis, extraocular muscle enlargement, and corneal involvement, and then kind of the most severe sight loss due to optic nerve compression. So one other thing that comes up with um, surgical treatment of thyroid eye disease um, is the type of uh, surgery you do in terms of the muscle surgery. So do you do recession or resection of muscles in thyroid eye disease? Was it recess? Correct. So um, any in general, not just thyroid disease, but any restrictive um, condition should be recessed and not resected because that can actually worsen your restriction. So um, just remember that that um, if you have restriction in general, including things like intraoperative the inferior rectus, um, it should always be recessed and not recessed. Um, so the next one that I was going to talk about was this is a busier slide, but uh, chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. Um, and so this is kind of a, a group of different conditions. So um, they're overall characterized as an insidiously progressive symmetric immobility of the eyes. There's typically ptosis or bicularis weakness and then spearing of the pupils. Uh, the movements remain limited with doll's head and caloric stimulation. Um, so some of the the ones that they talk about is oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. Um, on the OCAPs, kind of the association is like French Canadian families. Um, and then there's this polyadenylate binding protein nuclear one gene that's been, um, that's been characterized in this condition. Um, but there's uh, dysphagia, so the oculopharyngeal portion, and then the family history of ophthalmoplegia. Um, current SAIR is the one that we're probably most familiar with, so it's a triad of CPEO. There's cardiac conduction deficits, which the OCAP likes because that's one thing that can kill people and they want to make sure you're getting that on boards and everything. Um, and then pigmentary retinopathy. And then there's also the, um, the CPEO, uh, so ophthalmoplegia plus conditions, which is CPEO with some other additional findings. So it can be pretty variable. So elevated CSF protein, you can have spongiform degeneration of the, uh, the, uh, the brain or brain stem, it said slowed EEG and then hearing loss. And then on uh, muscle biopsy, so either ocular or limb, you should see the ragged red fibers, so mitochondrial accumulation between the myofibrils or beneath the plasma membrane. Um, myotonic dystrophy is one that don't, I didn't ever really think of as much in terms of double vision, but it can. Um, so it's autosomal dominant muscular dystrophy in which myotonia is accompanied by dystrophic changes in other tissues. So trinucleotide repeats on chromosome 19 or chromosome 3. Um, kind of the classic things that we think of in terms of the ophthalmology would be the, the early cataracts, the Christmas tree or polychromatic cataracts. Um, but you can also get my, bilateral ptosis. You can, they can have a progressive external ophthalmoplegia. Um, they can have myotonia of lid closure and gaze holding, orbicularis weakness, myotic pupils, and then retinal pigmentary degeneration. Um, I put this in here, and I know that we'll get, this is more kind of in the headache category, but one thing was kind of ophthalmoplegic migraines, so you know, migraines can also give you double vision, uh, binocular double vision, and it can mimic a, a third nerve palsy. Um, I guess classic, you'd expect this to resolve, but it, the, this function could be permanent. Um, and it usually kind of starts, the, the cranial nerve finding usually starts to come on after the um, headache abates, or as the headache starts to abate. Um, this was, I, there were some other things, because this was kind of the garbage can one for double vision. Um, so I didn't talk about, or I'm not going to talk about 
you know, entrapment from orbit fractures, but, you know, common things being common, we're in Utah, and nobody wears helmets when they drive their ATVs off cliffs, so always think about that. You know, you can have like a silent sinus syndrome, there's that sort of thing. Orbital inflammatory syndrome can also give you double vision, but, you know, in all the ones that I've seen, that's never been the presenting complaint, is my eyes are double, so their eye is killing them, and it's super red and bulging out of their head, but those are other things that can give you double vision. Um, this was, you know, one that I've actually only seen like twice myself. Um, so Brown syndrome or uh, superior oblique sheath syndrome, it's limitation of uh, elevation of the eye and adduction due to restriction of the superior oblique tendon in the trochlea. Um, elevation and abduction is usually normal or near normal. Um, so the affected eye is usually hypotropic and then the patient adopts a chin up and then uh, face turn away from the affected eye. And really, to make this diagnosis for the restriction within the trochlea, you need to do forced ductions. And so the, the two that I've seen have been traumatic. Like one was a kid that got stepped on pretty bad and had a bunch of bad facial fractures. And the other one was actually kind of at the beginning of this year. A woman got, or I guess it was technically last year, a woman got nailed in the face with a fin slash. And she had a pretty big hematoma uh, on top of the globe. Uh, but the eye was hypotropic. and. So she ended up seeing Patel, and she disinserted her levator, um, and I think he was going to fix that. But then um, she was kind of persistently hypotropic as well, and saw Hoffman, and he. Um, we just fixed that. The oh, other you day. did. Yeah. How'd it go? Good. Awesome. So was it with was induction positive? Mm -hmm. Awesome. So yeah, I, it, it was one that you see a lot more test questions on this, I guess, than you actually see it. But it does happen. It turns out. So I thought that was kind of cool to see it. So just to mention something about Brown, to me at least, Brown syndrome isn't really a traumatic syndrome. So when I think of Brown syndrome, it's usually restriction without trauma. And um, so the one thing to allow in children who come in with the findings of Brown syndrome, and usually, you know, you do have occasional adults, but it's generally children, um, is sinusitis. So um, I guess for me, with, with Brown syndrome or trauma, well, it's not true restriction and it's not true trochlear abnormality per se, um, because there's trauma to explain that. So um, often the cases that you will pre get presented with Brown syndrome are actually just kind of spontaneous to both in children. And um, then you have to differentiate between a Brown syndrome and your oblique uh, palsy. And, um, one thing to remember and like you know if this then that think if you see Brown syndrome um, think about CT um, sinuses to allow the sinusitis causing trochlear abnormalities. Um, and then this I think this is the last one I had I'm in here was superior oblique myokymia and so you get these paroxysmal rapid vertical and torsional uh, movements of the eye they're usually super small and then can often require the ceiling to visualize. And uh, you can kind of precipitate this by asking the patient to look in the direction of the, uh, the affected superior oblique. And then um, and the treatment was, you know, I think it's a part of that sort of stuff. So anything else that I should have included? The only other thing is um, neuromyotonia. Oh, yeah. Um, and neuromyotonia um, is usually, it can be third nerve. Neuromyotonia, but the muscle will go into kind of a spasm, and often what happens is it can, you know, kind of like get stuck uh, for a period of time and then get better. The typical uh, scenario is the person has had radiation for a pituitary tumor, and that that's one of the things that you can see it after. But I've seen it just spontaneously occur as well. It's like a spasm. Of one of the muscles, like usually the medial rectus, could be the medial rectus, it can mimic like a six nerve palsy uh, for or an intermittent six. And, um, and you can also treat that with neuromyotonia as well. Yeah.